All right. Well, I think it's uh, one o'clock Mountain Daylight Time. So I think it's time to begin uh, the uh, VAMO seminar. So uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the new board members. I'm Ivan Deutsch here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it's a great pleasure for me to begin my emceeing by welcoming Professor Liang Jiang, who will deliver today's seminar. Uh, Liang uh, got his BS at Caltech and did his PhD at Harvard with Misha Lukin, uh, and then followed that with a postdoc at Caltech as a Sherman Fairchild Fellow, um, and joined the faculty at Yale following that in 2012. And since last year, Yang, you've been a uh, professor at the University of Chicago. Um, so Liang is really one of uh, the great uh, leaders in our field, uh, young stars who really has done tremendous work in all of what we call the pillars of quantum information science in quantum communications, in quantum sensing, in quantum simulation and quantum computation. And Liang uh, has been tremendous in his collaborations, particularly the, the, the groundbreaking work he did while he was at Yale together with Steve Gervin, Rob Shlokoff, Michelle Devereux, and really making circuit QED for quantum computation a reality. Um, so we're really delighted to have him here. And today he's gonna talk to us about bosonic quantum information processing with superconducting circuits. So welcome Liang, take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Ivan, for the nice introduction. And, and also I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, some of these recent results about uh, bosonic quantum information processing using superconducting circuits. So this is a, like a highly collaborative work between theory and experimental groups. And uh, I hope that you'll find uh, the kind of the, these recent results like interesting and exciting. So um, I would say like a first, like a quantum information is a highly interdisciplinary field, which uh, uh, also have a wide range of applications from computing, communication, sensing, and uh, uh, simulations. And uh, for bosonic systems actually also play an important role for quantum information processing, because you can use the superconducting cavity modes to store and processing information. And also this uh, optical communication is actually using wave packets, which are also um, bosonic modes. And the gravitational wave sensors are also bosonic like cavity systems. And also boson sampling also uniquely um, captures some of the bosonic nature of the system. So one of the major challenges for bosonic quantum information processing is the excitation loss. If we store excitation in some of the optical modes or macro modes, after a certain time, the excitation will be lost to the environment because our really real world systems are not perfect. And now one outstanding question is actually, can we store information longer than the typical coherence time of these bosonic modes? If possible, then we can get even better quantum memories or even better quantum information processors. So that is actually one of the kind of like a key motivation question that we would like to kind of investigate uh, both theoretically and experimentally. So before we start talking about uh, how to overcome the loss, uh, loss errors, let's probably first think about how we can control uh, and the performing like universal control over the bosonic modes because we are probably familiar that we can use the beam splitters or phase shifters to control the bosonic modes and the building interferometers. But however, those information processing tools are still not universal. For example, with those controls, you cannot create a single photon flux state. And so we sort of need something which is more powerful that allow us to achieve universal control of these different bosonic modes. And for, I guess for this audience who are like on this AMO uh, seminar, which probably people are familiar that we can use atoms and optical cavities and to couple the two systems. And uh, because the atoms has like a, you can model it as a two level system, which has a nonlinearity. So you can use this nonlinear two level system to control this optical mode so that you can actually perform a universal uh, unitaries 
or prepare arbitrary quantum states of these bosonic modes. And similarly, um, one can find a correspondence in the microwave domain by placing a superconducting like Josephson device. Here is the Cooper pair box as a two level artificial atom that coupled to a bosonic microwave cavity. And uh, by engineering these couplings and also with different drives, you can actually prepare these superconducting cavity and the two level atoms, the combined system to arbitrary states. And this is kind of a schematic, which is uh, kind of a, about maybe uh, about decades ago that people show. And the more recently, like people can actually find that the three dimensional superconducting cavity can give you a much longer coherence time. So that's why actually the platform now actually in some sense look more similar to the atoms in the cavity. Now you have a, a strip of this uh, a sapphire chip, which has a Josephson device, which coupled to actually a three dimensional superconducting cavity. And uh, so for this system, um, which here in this figure, we basically have a piece of aluminum with these two trenches correspond to superconducting cavities. And uh, one of the cavity is used for storage and the other of the cavity is for the readout. And the Josephson device, because of the Josephson nonlinearity, similar to the atom case, you have like a, a two level system. Here we can create a, some like a, a transmount device, which you can hear for simplicity in case as a two level system that introduce nonlinearity, allow us to perform universal control over the storage cavity. And for simplicity, we can tentatively ignore the readout cavity so that we just consider essentially a two level system and a, a bosonic system. And when we tune the frequency of the transmount and the qubits to be uh, quite different, maybe typically these frequencies are of order gigahertz while the detuning can also be comparable of order gigahertz then essentially the energy difference is so large, so basically you only virtually exchange excitations between the two. And that induces basically this effective Hamiltonian, which consists of the energy of the bosonic system, which is proportional to number of excitations in the cavity, and also the energy of the two level system. And there is a dispersive coupling between the two level system and the bosonic system. And this, typically the cavity, uh, cavity frequency and the qubit frequency are of order gigahertz, while the dispersive coupling of order megahertz. Uh, and more impressively, the decoherence for the superconducting cavity and this uh, transmount device is of order kilohertz, which is orders of magnitude smaller compared to the coupling strength. So therefore, to a very good approximation, we can treat the system as an effective Hamiltonian uh, unitary evolution. And moreover, besides the long coherence time of the qubit and the cavity, and of course notice here, the cavity lifetime can be over a few milliseconds, which is much longer than the qubit's lifetime. So we can sort of think we may want to shift the paradigm instead of storing information in the qubit, it might be better to store information in the cavity, which is actually a natural, really good quantum memory. And in addition, we can also perform like a fast, quantum non-demolishing readout of the superconducting qubit with uh, the recent development of quantum limited amplifiers. So basically one can achieve like a high fidelity readout with 99% uh, or higher in about a few hundred nanoseconds. Moreover, we can also use this like FPGA control uh, techniques to allow us to achieve like adaptive, uh, adaptive quantum control, which is kind of saying like based on the real time measurement, you can decide what is the operation to do in the next time step. And this is important if we want to do error correction because we want to make a different operations conditioned on our syndrome detection. So combine these three kind of advances, it's actually, I will show in the next few slides that one can really make a lot of uh, like uh, advances using our superconducting platforms. So um, here, maybe let's first take a look at how we actually control the system because so far what I've written down is a static time independent Hamiltonian. And uh, what's the control knobs we have? Actually two control knobs. One is we can drive the cavity resonantly, which is this uh, epsilon with a time dependent drive for the cavity. And in addition, we can also drive the qubit. And because of this dispersive coupling between the qubit and the cavity, you can think it as actually depending on different cavity photon number excitations, there will be a different uh, frequency shift of the qubit. So maybe we can drive the qubit with different frequency tones and each tone corresponds to 
a corresponding particular photon number in the cavity. So that's why I drive the, I write the qubit drives as a sum of different frequency tones associated with a different number of excitations in the cavity. So now let's try to understand, okay, what these controls can give us. So first let's go to the rotating frame of the cavity and tentatively don't consider the cavity drive. Basically, we just have the qubit drive for the moment. And the, the, uh, here are the energy levels associated with the static part of this Hamiltonian in the rotating frame. So there is an energy difference between the ground and excited states, which is omega q. And the, the dispersive coupling between the cavity and the qubit will basically like shift the energy levels of the excited states with the amount of shift proportional to the number of excitations inside the cavity. Okay, so now if I can add the drives of the qubit, suppose I choose the particular frequency, which is the resonant to the transition associated from the ground to the excited states and uh, with uh, also resonant when there are only two excitations in the cavity, then basically first I can spectroscopically resolve this drive because the dispersive coupling chi of order megahertz is much larger than the line weights, which is of order kilohertz. So basically I can resolve these transitions individually and I apply a specific tone to drive. And the one common drive we can apply are basically two pi pulses. And if I apply two sequential pi pulses with a relative phase with respect to each other, so the relative phase phi n, then basically what will happen is that if there are two photons in the cavity, it will be, the qubit will be excited to the excited state and then come back to the ground state. And here is a diagram like in the block sphere, it go from the ground to the excited state and then come back to the ground state and the enclose a non-trivial area in the block sphere, which will accumulate a geometric phase for this particular photon number state n equal to two. While for different other photon number states, basically the qubit is off resonant. So there is negligible geometric phase being accumulated. So basically we can implement a photon number specific phase gate. And then because we, these are different frequency tones, we can actually drive these uh, qubit, uh, drive the qubit with multiple frequency tones simultaneously. Then by closing this loop in the block sphere conditioned on different like, photon numbers, we can imprint a selective number dependent arbitrary phase gate, which we call it the snap gate for short. Okay, and uh, so basically what it does is that we can start from the qubit or the transmon in the ground state, while the cavity has a superposition of different photon numbers. And for different photon number, it will accumulate a phase. And that phase only depending on our frequency, our different drive frequency tones and the relative phase difference between the two sequential pulses. So therefore we can, and this phase is our, our, at our control. So the entire evolution, you can think it as we just imprint a number dependent phase phi n. And if this phi n is proportional to n, then we induce effectively a unitary evolution associated with the detuning. If phi n is proportional to n square, it's a second order, it's a Kerr effect. If phi n is proportional to n cube or higher power, it's a higher order Kerr effect. So basically by borrowing the nonlinearity from the two level system and um, via this drive pulses, we can implement like arbitrary order Kerr effect for our bosonic system. And moreover, we can also um, drive the cavity by changing different photon numbers because the Kerr effect, the snap gate that we get actually doesn't change photon number. In order to get the universal control, we need to change the photon number and the displacement operation in the cavity enables us to do it. So combining the snap gate and the displacement operation, we find that actually we can show in the theory, like uh, we can achieve universal control of the combined cavity qubit system with both cavity and the qubit drives. So here universal control means you can get arbitrary unitary evolution over this combined system. So maybe let's get some like, look at some examples, how we actually achieve such a universal control. So first, maybe can we do state arbitrary state preparation? As I mentioned, it would be nice if we can prepare a single photon state deterministically. And here is actually a three pulse scheme to prepare a single photon Fox state. So suppose you start from vacuum. What you do is alternating your displacement and the snap gate. So first you play a small displacement 
And here in the middle is a weakness function of a, a small displaced vacuum, which is a coherent state. And the upper panel is the photon number distribution, uh, which a population distribution in the FOC basis. And the arrow indicates the relative phase between these different components. And the lower panel is basically like a frequency scan of the, the response on the cavity system that you'll find that the different peaks correspond to different populations of the, uh, of the cavity. And uh, then we apply a snap gate. What the snap gate does is basically it introduces a pi phase shift for the vacuum component of the cavity. And you notice in the Wigner function, this is the experimental data, you actually get a negative hole in, the, in this region, which is indicating you now actually create a non-trivial quantum state. And if you look at the population distribution measured from, from the, uh, the system, it actually doesn't change too much, okay? But this Wigner function looks very similar to a single photon Fox state up to some displacement. So basically we displace it back to the origin and we find that actually we create a single photon Fox state. And uh, here you can interpret uh, another perspective is basically there is an interference between different Fox components. And when you do displacements, then the neighboring photon number states will interfere. And then when you choose a coefficient appropriately, then the other components will destructively interfere and only the single photon component constructively interfere and you prepare the single photon state. And of course, this is approximately preparing it and you can get about 99% in theory. And uh, if you repeat this procedure more with more parameters, you can actually get very, very high uh, precision in theory. And um, so this is just a state preparation. You can also like perform arbitrary unitary controls of the bosonic mode. So for example, here, suppose you want to control up to from vacuum up to seven excitation, which is eight dimensional space. You can kind of write down a unitary, which basically is performing the operation of photon number plus four modulo eight. And this is actually a bit non-trivial operation. And uh, earlier we were considering the control of alternating snap and the uh, cavity drive. But in practice, we don't have to. And uh, even though it's a bit more complicated, so we actually left the computer to do the gradient uh, descent algorithm to find the optimum pulses. So if we fix the duration to be like one microsecond, which is actually comparable to the dispersive coupling chi, which is about the megahertz inverse. So we can perform uh, like a numerical optimization to, to do the gradient optimization. We find these pulse sequences. So here the, uh, the blue and the red trace correspond to the real imaginary part of the drive and associated with the qubit and the cavity, like in these two uh, sets of trajectories. And at the end of evolution, if we start from the vacuum, one can end up in the four photon Fox state. And the one way to see it, uh, this is the Wigner function, and you can count the number of rings, which is equal to four, that's indicating it's related to four photon Fox state. And this actually agrees quite well with the theory. And to calibrate how good we can do the gates, then uh, we, one need to kind of like a, uh, one way to do it is to do this randomized benchmarking. And here for a particular choice of basis, which I will talk about later, the CAT basis, you will find that you can do a set of gates with the X, Y, or Z rotations and the Hardman gates and so on. And you'll find that the average fidelity is about like about 99%. And the reason you get a 1%-ish error is because typically the gates, as I mentioned earlier, take about like a one microsecond. And these, uh, a transmount device, the nonlinear Josephson device, which has about like a hundred microsecond lifetime. So basically like while we're doing the gates, there's a 1% chance that uh, this nonlinear device may have an error. And that, that's why it limits uh, the performance to be about 99%. Okay, uh, but we don't think this is actually the fundamental limit because later on I'll briefly mention that we can design some of the operations using error transparency or path independence to get a even better fidelity gates. And that's still like some work on the investigation. Yeah, but um, before I switch the topic, I want to point out that here, I'm just talking about the unitary gate, but actually our systems allow us to do something even more because the most general quantum control is actually something called the CPTP map, the complete positive trace preserving map. And this is a map which maintains the positivity of a density matrix and preserves the trace of density matrix, which are the two key requirements of quantum mechanics. And it turns out that this is the most general map allowed by quantum mechanics. So usually for CPTP map, one can use something called a cross representation for a CPTP map, 
and the way to write it is that the density matrix goes to kind of like a mixture of different evolutions of the system. So if there's only like one mixture, which n equal to one, then essentially you get the unitary evolution. But if n is larger than one, you can think your system evolving in a kind of someone is uh, playing the dice and determining which path the system evolution will take. And then for the CPTP map, these k's are called cross operators and they need to satisfy the constraint that the sum over k dagger k equal to identity, which makes sure that it's trace preserving. But other than that, it basically like it gets the most general quantum processes. And generally with people, if you have D level system and the standard recipe is saying you need a D square level ancilla initialized to certain states and let it couple to a system. So you do a unitary evolution over the D cube times D cube. Uh, this unitary evolution, then you trace out the ancilla, you recover this most general CPTP map. And this procedure, actually the standard procedure is actually very demanding because if you have 10 level system, you need a hundred level ancilla in order to achieve this desired CPTP map. And so one question is, can we actually reduce the num uh, this number of levels for the ancilla so that we can still implement such a CPTP map? without a significant additional ancilla overhead. And uh, the answer turns out that it's possible. And also we don't need like a huge number of level for the ancilla. And actually in principle, we can reduce the number of level ancilla to be equal to two. But the trick is that we need to repeatedly use the ancilla and perform adaptive control conditioned on some previous measurements of the ancilla. So here, let me sketch what is the idea. So basically, suppose we have a D-level QDIT, or you can think it as the lowest uh, uh, D-levels from a uh, subsystem from a bosonic mode. And we have a two-level ancilla. This potentially could be our transmog or our Josephson device. And we have this system uh, and ancilla, and we can perform some like a unitary evolution between the system and ancilla, and we measure the ancilla. So that gives us one classical bit of information. So conditioned on this one classical bit of information, you can decide what unitary to apply over the system and ancilla in the second round. Then you measure the ancilla again, and that gives you two classical bits of information, which allow you to determine what unitary to apply in the third round. And then you measure the ancilla again. So basically you can repeat this procedure. And at some point, basically after the log two n, where n is the number of different paths you can get, which is actually upper bounded by kind of two log two d, where d is the dimension of the system. Basically the depth of the circuit only scale logarithmically with the dimension of the system. Then you can basically stop the procedure and it will give you the output of the system, which implements this CPTP map. So this is actually a very efficient circuit. As I mentioned, this depth is shallow and also you just need a two level ancilla which is much easier compared to like a D square level ancilla. But the, the requirement is slightly different because you need to be able to measure the ancilla and do real time adaptive control. But we think that this is actually not too demanding. At least it's experimentally feasible using supernatin platform. Because as I mentioned earlier, one can perform a universal control over if the system is a cavity and the ancilla is the transform, then you can perform a universal control between the system, uh, cavity and the transform. Moreover, as I mentioned earlier, one can perform a quantum non-demolishing measurement of the ancilla, which is the transmog qubit, and also do this real-time adaptive control using FPGA. So basically all these ingredients have been demonstrated in different parts of the uh, different like a qubit experiment. So we think that this is actually some scheme which is feasible and can be achieved experimentally. So let me just point out that this CPTP map is really powerful because it essentially can implement any physical processes allowed by quantum mechanics, including like initialization, dissipation, thermalization, or even quantum error correction, which I'll talk about like uh, in just a uh, in next few slides, uh, in a few slides later. Yeah, so um, maybe let me just uh, give a quick summary about what's applicable in terms of quantum control. So we can do arbitrary state preparation, which I showed the example of a single photon state preparation. And you can do arbitrary unitary gates or even the most general CPTP map, which is also called quantum channel, which is allowed by quantum mechanics. And even more generally here, 
what I'm talking is actually so far mostly focusing on the unitary control, because here I'm doing Hamiltonian evolution between the system uh, and some ancillary. And uh, this is just a one type of control. And actually you can consider a combination of unitary and engineer dissipation. And the one way to think of it is that uh, the engineer dissipation will actually induce some like a steady state subspace. So basically any evolution will, of the system will then be projected to the steady state subspace. So the, uh, the dynamics will also be projected. So in that case, actually combining this unitary evolution and the engineer dissipation, you can also induce some other ways to do universal control over the system. And moreover, even more dramatically, is that you can completely forget about the unitary part and just do the dissipative control. And it turns out it's also possible to do universal control over a particular subspace. And this is what we call the holonomic quantum control. And the idea is basically you can perform closed loop operations in the phase space, but even though it's a closed loop, it actually induces a non-trivial evolution over some logical space. And that allows you to also do universal quantum computing, which is detailed in some of these references. In case you're interested, you may want to look it over there. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to go to further more details about the quantum control. And, uh, mm, out, uh, and the, mm, it's probably a good time to ask questions about the control part before I switch to the quantum error correction of the bosonic loss errors. Yeah. All right, very good. Uh, I guess I did fail to remind people that they can answer, uh, enter their questions into the Q&A on the Zoom or on the chat feature in the uh, uh, YouTube live stream. But we do have a few questions, so uh, mm -hmm. I'll answer them here. So uh, Yu Ting asked, could you please tell us a bit more about how to generate arbitrary superpositions of photonic Fox states do you, with grape, is that what you're doing? How can you tell us some more details about that? Yes, I think we have like a different ways to do it. One could be analytic. There's actually a way that we can show that uh, uh, construct, okay, how you actually like uh, induce like a different superpositions of population of Fox states, which if you're interested, I would uh, recommend this uh, PIE paper, which uh, gives uh, a procedure of doing that. And uh, maybe I should also point out that actually before this work, like earlier on, like John Martinez and others also had a work, but it's in a different Hamiltonian, not dispersive, but like more like James Cunning's Hamiltonian. And they demonstrated that one can prepare arbitrary superposition of Fox states. But here we probably go one more step further. We say besides state preparation, we can also do unitary and also even do arbitrary quantum processes. Yeah. Good. And maybe related to that, Adam Kaufman asks, in the, in the arbitrary control, is it for the combined uh, cubic cavity space or is it on just one of the subspace or a finite dimensional space? In what sense is it controllable? Yes, so in the original theory paper here, uh, this PI 2015, we actually showed it was a universal control for the cavity mode. And later on, we realized that actually with just a very simple, like a uh, few more steps of operation of the qubit, it can be universal over the combined system of the qubit and the cavity. So indeed it's a universal control over the combined system. Combined yeah. system. And if you couple more qubits to the same cavity, is it still possible to implement arbitrary unitaries, but now on this larger space? Uh, I think it's- qubits? Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, um, because I, I don't see like a which step would prevent us from doing that, but uh, um, yeah, uh, okay. I, I think it's possible, but I need to check it, yeah. Right. And then we have a couple of questions about the snap gate. So Christy Q asks, does the snap gate work for non-transmon qubits? For example, fluxonium, uh, what is the role of the higher levels in the, yeah. in, in the ladder, it's not quite a qubit. Yes, so in this case, uh, actually, I think it works for any two level system as long as it's in the strong dispersive regime, which is as long as the chi is much larger than decoherence of the two level system and the decoherence of the cavity, then basically you can perform snap gate. So it should work for the, uh, the fluxonian or other qubits if it's, uh, if it's uh, in the strong dispersive region coupled to the cavity. 
and uh, maybe even with atomic system, it might be possible. It's just the one need to uh, make sure the coupling strength is strong enough. And I think recently people also demonstrated with after mechanical, or with a uh, sorry mechanical uh, coupled to like a uh, Joseph and uh, transma, and one can also like uh, push in the strong dispersive regime. Yeah. All right, and we probably should continue. We'll take another break when we're ready for other questions. I remind people to please answer enter their questions into the Q and A on Zoom and, and also on the YouTube live stream. So Yang, yeah, continue. Okay, so now let's actually move on to the second part, which actually at the beginning, I was uh, in this question that, okay, well, can we actually store information longer than the typical coherence time of some bosonic cavity mode? And uh, so now the question is, okay, can we do actually error correction or how to correct excitation loss errors? Suppose we already have and the universal control or even more general the CPTP map. So uh, one thing which probably maybe let's give like a brief review about wh how, what's the idea of this quantum error correction. So the key idea probably for this slide is that you should introduce redundancy so that you have more flexibility to tolerate and even identify or correct errors. So for two level systems, one way to do it is we need a tensor product of more two level systems, get a larger Hilbert space, and the correct individual like poly errors associated with the individual qubits. But for oscillators, in some sense, we're actually at a better starting point. One is for single bosonic modes, we already have many energy levels. So it is a very large Hilbert space. And maybe we can just pick some two dimensional subspace to store information that allow us to correct error. And second is the bosonic error in, the, in this system typically is excitation loss or dephasing error. And if it's excitation loss, it actually has a pattern. Every time there's a photon loss, it reduces the excitation by exactly one, or at most one, okay? Even if we can include the phasing error. So therefore, you will find that there is a pattern in the structure in the error, so probably you can take advantage of it. For example, if you store excitation information in the even photon subspace, then a photon loss will induce a parity change, which can be measured and help you to identify those errors. So basically, I think that uh, the key idea is that we need to introduce redundancy in the system. And uh, if we have a knowledge about the error, then we can design a better quantum error correcting code to correct those errors. So regarding bosonic error correction, it's actually a topic which people have been studying for more than two decades. And there are a zoo of bosonic codes. And uh, so this slide is actually prepared by my former student, Victor Albert, when he was visiting Australia. So you're seeing that very interesting animals here. But uh, generally, you can think they can have like a in Fox state encoding using zero and one, or like a higher photon Fox state superpositions. Or if you think of bosonic mode as superposition of coherent states, then you can have some different coherent states encoding. Or if you think your bosonic or harmonic oscillators are just position and momentum, they are also like a position momentum type related eigenstates. Or maybe you can hybrid your bosonic modes with qubit with some hybrid coding. But if you look at the kind of history of what happened with bosonic coding, there are lots of codes developed around the 2000s when kind of optical quantum computing, kind of like a, uh, there are lots of ideas there. And more recently when supersymmetric platform takes off, there are more bosonic codes also being invented. So maybe the question here we want to ask is actually, can we actually use a single bosonic mode to correct excitation loss errors? As I mentioned earlier, we do have a redundancy in our system. So can we actually do it with just a single mode? Because experimentally, it will be easier if we just have a single bosonic mode uh, coupled to some uh, additional ancillary system to correct errors. So before we look into a quantum code, it might be good to learn to see what we can do with the classical code. So the classical coding, which is actually a very successful code, is called the phase shifted key PSK. So the idea of phase shifted keying is actually pretty simple. So it's actually encoding information in the phase of a coherent state. As we all know from kind of uh, optics, uh, basically a coherent state has, can be described by two real numbers. One is amplitude, one is, is phase. And in the presence of loss, even though we don't know how much is the loss rate, we probably don't know what is the amplitude, but actually the phase information is still preserved in the presence of loss. So we can encode classical information in the face of a coherent state. So I can encode it as a coherent state alpha or coherent state minus alpha. And this actually encodes like one classical bit of information. If I have loss, the face of the coherent state information is still preserved so I can still recover it. I can encode it with a 
four coherent states with equal amplitude but different phase. And that allows me to encode two classical bits. And I can encode three classical bits with eight different coherent components of a single mode. So basically, the more phase angles we have, the more information we can encode up to a point that we cannot further distinguish between different coherent components. And this is a very successful scheme, widely used in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Now we can try to extend this to the quantum case. So ideally, if there's no loss, we can say these are four coherent states, we can encode two quantum bits of information as well. However, in the presence of attenuation, if we don't know whether or not there is excitation loss, then actually the relative phase between these different superposition of the coherent states will be smeared out. So basically, instead of doing that, let's maybe remember like in the error correction, we should introduce redundancy. So here, if we have four level system, we'd probably be less ambitious just to encode one quantum bit and use the other degree of freedom to help us to detect or even correct errors. So here, the idea is actually because the photon loss only is one by one, so let's store information in the even parity subspace. So here we can say we have a coherent state alpha minus alpha, symmetric superposition give us the even parity code. And the I alpha and the minus I alpha, the symmetric combination give also another logical code word. So when alpha is large enough, these two code words are almost orthogonal, which can give us a basis. Moreover, these code words both have even parity. So if there's a parity photon loss, it will change the parity, which allow us to detect individual photon loss events. So just to, here is an illustration that how we can actually preserve the information while detecting photon loss events. So suppose I start with a state which has a superposition of the logical zero and logical one with these coefficients. In the presence of single excitation loss, I find that I go from this even states to the odd states, which correspond to anti-symmetric superpositions of uh, some different coherent components. And uh, moreover, there will be some phase accumulation. But this is a, a significant change in the parity, which we can detect in principle. And moreover, if you have two photon loss, you go back to even, but you introduce some like a Z logical error. And if there are three photon, you go to odd and four photon loss, go back to even again, but this time it actually completes a circle of life and go back to the original state to start with. So basically the key property is that we can detect single excitation loss by measuring parity. And we only need to track single photon loss modulo four. So this scheme tells us that uh, first we can not only detect the photon loss errors and also we can even restore the information because one way to think of it is if you know how many photon modulo four uh, photon loss modulo four, you know how to interpret the state that still stays in the cavity, and which means that quantum information is still there. So basically, we can correct single photon loss errors. So now, maybe one question is how do we perform a parity measurement without destroying the state? Because in optic systems, when we can count the photon number, photon number, we destroy the system. And here, we want to know the parity information without destroying the system. So the key idea is actually what we are familiar with is the Ramsey experiment. So, and also using the dispersive Hamiltonian we have. So here, the scheme is that basically we have a, some like a cat state, which is stored in the cavity. And we have a two level system, which again is this transmount device that are initialized in this superposition, symmetric superposition of ground and excited state. And then we let this two level system couple to our bosonic modes with this dispersive coupling. And this dispersive coupling let it evolve for time, which is pi over chi, so that you can think that every single photon will induce a pi phase shift for the excited state. And if you have an even number of photons, you will induce an integer multiple of two pi phase shift for the excited state. So therefore it actually performs identity operation over this two level system. If you have odd number of photons, then you induce an odd integer multiple of pi phase shift for the excited state. So you induce a Z operation for the two level system and the two level ancillary. And then basically, if you start from the symmetric superposition of G plus E, after this evolution, it will evolve into symmetric or anti-symmetric superposition of G plus E, depending on the parity of the photon in the cavity. And this anti-symmetric and anti-symmetric basis are orthogonal. So you can basically do another like a, 90 degree rotation around the y axis and then measure it in the plus in the g and e basis to unambiguously distinguish the parity. And notice here we extract one classical bit of information of parity and then nothing more. 
So basically, we only get the parity information without uh, causing additional like a projection or collapsing of a quantum state. So now, just as a summary about the quantum error correction procedure, we have the encoding, which is the cat code, as I mentioned earlier, store information in the even parity subspace. And uh, the way to monitor the error is basically uh, repeatedly measure parity of the cavity photon number. And then if we measure it frequently enough, we will be identify every single photon loss event so that at the end of the experiment, we know how many photons have been lost and we will find the correct interpretation of the encoded state in the system. And that will allow us to restore the original state. So here is the experimental data obtained from Rob Shilkoff's group. And the horizontal axis is time. Vertical axis is the process fidelity, which tells me how good the information is stored and preserved. And the, when it's one, it's indicating it's perfect. So this is actually in order to show like we actually, the error correction is doing like a kind of a, a non-trivial task. We want to compare it with the best scheme you can have to store information without error correction. Because we are competing, we are trying to uh, uh, suffering, we suffer from the excitation loss error. The best scheme to do uh, to store information without error correction is to minimize the number of excitation in the system, which is basically using vacuum and a single photon state to encode one quantum bit of information. And for this scheme, you'll find actually the typical lifetime is about 300 microseconds. So now let's look at if we do the cat code, but without doing error correction, you find that actually the coherence decays a bit faster because you have more excitation in the system and more vulnerable to loss. On the other hand, once you restore uh, adding this error correction to the, to the procedure, you find that actually the lifetime is actually getting comparable even a little bit better than the best scheme you can do without the error correction. So this is kind of what we mean by that in the experiment claim as the reaching the break even point. So the error correction you can do is actually already comparable or even slightly better than the best scheme you can do without error correction. So it starts to show uh, potential advantage of quantum error correction. So one natural question people will ask is, well, can we do better? What's limiting us from just getting to the break even and uh, go to like a go beyond the break even? And uh, this limiting, uh, what's limiting us is actually when we do the gates, this uh, ancilla system, which is a transmount, uh, actually decay. And it may induce like a percentage error. And when we kind of do multiple steps of error correction, those errors, the measurement, each measurement, you have to introduce some additional decoherence to the system, which actually limits our performance of going beyond break even. So if we look at it more carefully, there is a procedure we want to extract the parity information. And that procedure requires dispersive coupling between the cavity and the two-level system for some time, which is pi over chi, which is typically of order of microsecond. So during that time, if your two-level system decay and you don't know when it decay, you actually deface the cavity because before after decay, the cavity has a different frequency, different spec chi. But if, if you don't know the time, then you lose track of the phase of the cavity. And that's actually the limiting issue. Now, here is actually one solution we think is really promising and you're getting some like a recent data show it might work is instead of using two level transmount device, we can actually use the third level of the transmount to help us to solve this question. So one simple way to understand is if we have a third level, we can use the first and the third level to encode information to acquire the parity. If a decay happens, then the third level will decay to the second level of the transmount, and we'll be able to detect at the end of the experiment that obviously something decay happened. So we'll be able to detect the decay error. And moreover, if we make sure that the Hamiltonian between coupling between this, uh, the cavity and the three level transmount, has a property that the frequency shift for the third and the second level is equal. Uh, it has induced equal frequency shift to the cavity. Then it doesn't matter whether the transmount is in the second or third level, it induces an equal amount of frequency shift for the cavity. So that implies it doesn't matter uh, when the decay happened from the third to second level. So that will enable us to induce something which you call uh, the error transparent gate. So basically that uh, we don't know when the decay happened, but as long as we know decay happened, it is equivalent to say the decay happened at the end. So this is like error transparency condition, which actually we can take advantage of to enable us to actually induce a more robust like a parity measurement, which actually has recently been experimentally demonstrated 
and so that the parity measurement would not be limited by the decay of the transform. Moreover, um, in a more recent experiment and combined with the theory, we generalize this error transparency condition to the path independent condition. You can think of the evolution as a path integral. And if the transmog or the ancillary end up in the same state, you will see that the system is evolving under some known unitary evolution. And that's sufficient to maintain the coherence of the system. And we can say, besides just doing parity measurement, we can even do quantum control immune to the error of this vulnerable ancillary system. So basically we get the, both, uh, get the best from both. We get a good coherence from the cavity. We also get a good nonlinearity from the ancilla without suffering from the dominant ancillary decoherence. So it's kind of like a four tolerant version of the control, uh, but for this bosonic mode case. Yeah, so um, I guess that's maybe, um, um, Shall I move on or maybe wait for questions? Yeah. There are a couple of questions okay. that perhaps mm -hmm. we can ask at this stage. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, let's see. Um, one question I have is, of course, in the time that you're not detecting a photon, the amplitude will decay. Because not seeing a photon is information too. So. Yeah. How does how does the code deal with that, or what do you do in that case? Yes. Uh, here, uh, excellent question, and uh, I have to say that I kind of uh, uh, oversimplify the error model a little bit because in the presence of photon loss, this is true, right? And but if there's no loss, then actually the amplitude will decay because that's indicating that it's less. Uh, it's more likely the amplitude is smaller, right? It's kind of a induced back action, even if you don't detect the photon. And for that case, that's one way to do it is that so you can kind of, you need to pump the system, uh, which can be performed by a unitary operation, or you can introduce engineer dissipation to pump the system. So uh, indeed, if you want to store information longer, then it will be needed to like a store, uh, to kind of actively pump the system so that uh, uh, you don't want your coherence state to decay to the vacuum ultimately. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, John Kunjunman asks, so what does the recovery operation after detecting say one photon loss look like? Specifically, since you have four coherent states in your code, how do you yeah. fit, flip the phase of the necessary coherent stage without messing up the others? Yeah, so I think that uh, I could give like a, maybe a simple answer would be, uh, first that these are kind of like a, uh, these are orthogonal states and you can induce a, you can always write down a unitary evolution to, to map this one error state to the logical state, right? And uh, which doesn't depend on the coefficient because it's a mapping from two dimensional subspace to another orthogonal two dimensional subspace. If you can write down that unitary, you can plug in your grip algorithm and it will give you a powers to implement that unitary. And uh, if you want to go more explicit, say how do I induce a phase shift for this? One way to do it is I can displace the cavity. So for example, I can change the phase associated with minus alpha. So that minus alpha goes to the vacuum component while the other alpha components have like a large number of photons. And I can use a snap gate to flip the phase of this, man, of this vacuum component, which trace back, you actually change the phase of a particular coherent leg. Yeah, so that's a more constructive way to do it, even though in practice that the experimental best find that it's easier to do snap gate. Uh, but uh, of course, for this experiment, it was kind of like a track different uh, photon number loss and uh, uh, do the interpretation instead of do the full decoding, but uh, it, it should be easy to do that. Yeah. Right. Maybe one last question this break. A Adam Kaufman asks, the, the error correcting code corrects for loss, but you might have also photon added if there's thermal noise. Is that an issue? Can you correct that? Yes, uh, practically, I think it could happen. And I think that for this experiment, it's actually system overall is much colder. So the added thermal noise to the cavity is actually negligible so far. Uh, but one way to overcome it is actually instead of using four leg cat, which uh, store photon number parity states, uh, you can use a six leg cat. You can say photon number modulo three. And that allows you to distinguish a photon loss and a photon addition, and then you can correct those errors. And of course, there are actually other codes which I didn't get a chance to mention, like uh, the binomial code or GKP code, which can correct the 
also like loss and the photon addition now. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, I think we'll continue. And again, I encourage people to enter their questions for the end of the talk. Yeah. So, so, so far I talked about error correction and I didn't talk about how you process information at this logical level. And I also mentioned there are different codes that one can encode in the bosonic case. And the, it turns out that actually the GKP code can really be very impressive. Just to give you an idea, if you have 10% loss, you can restore information to like 99.99% fidelity in theory. Okay, of course, nobody has, <laughs> that's uh, the assumptions that you recover perfectly. But now the question is actually, how do we do the logical gates? Like, uh, between different encoding. And one way to do it is that basically we can have uh, two bosonic modes. I want to do some like CNOT gate. One way to do it is that I can transfer state from one bosonic mode to ancillary and then do the gates and then transfer state back to the bosonic mode. So this procedure kind of like, it depends on what coding you're doing. Some are, sometimes this swap operation may be easy or may not be easy. And the one question is, can we actually perform logical operations kind of work for generic bosonic codes. You don't even need to know what the code is encoding the boson mode. You can actually perform some non-trivial gates between them, allow you to do universal computation. And the first look is that that might be too good to be true, but it turns out it's possible. The underlying reason is actually we have two gates which doesn't depend on the coding. One is identity gate, you don't do anything, it will be fine. The other gate is swap. If the both bosonic modes have the same coding, when you do the swap, it will still within the same coding subspace. And turns out identity and the swap is universal. It is enough. And the key idea is kind of summarized here that you can do something called the exponential swap gate. So the gate is, uh, uh, and so basically what you have two modes coming in and you perform literally this exponential swap. And the keep in mind the swap operation is a Hermitian operator. So you can write it in the exponents and get the unit of it. And that gives you a two mode gate. And the exponential swap gate is actually very useful because it allows you to do universal computing and the quantum principle component analysis or even quantum machine learning tasks as some of the papers that are posed by Seth Lloyd and so on. So now the definition of exponential swap is the following. Because swap square is identity. You swap twice, you get to identity. So swap just like a poly. If you have exponential of I times swap, you can write it as a superposition of identity and the swap where the coefficient determined by the theta angle. So now to understand the exponential swap, uh, maybe let's look at some simple example. So if your input state is vacuum and single photon Fox state, the beam splitter will give you a superposition of a zero, one, one, zero, while exponential swap will actually do something like a beam splitter. If you start input state is a Fox state one, one in both modes, then the beam splitter will have to give you some bunching while the exponential swap will actually still stay within the one one state. So it's more like a swap. So if you have some arbitrary states coming in phi and psi in A and B, the beam split is very complicated. And then swap is just a swap, but the exponential swap will give you some superposition of either original state or the swapped state. So this will actually give you some like good enough computing power, which you also have a good enough control so you don't go crazy like uh, the beam splitters. And also it maintains the code space and then you can use it to perform logical operations. So now the question is how do we perform exponential swap gate? Right, this is actually also a highly non-trivial gate to perform. And it turns out there is actually some mathematical identity which is very helpful to know before I talk about the explanation. So that mathematical identity is a parity also has a property which is the square of the parity is identity. So the exponential of the parity is also as kind of parity like a poly, like you get the superposition of identity and the parity. Similar to exponential of swap is the identity and the swap, okay? So now let's look at, uh, uh, or we're all familiar with Mahavendor interferometer. Suppose I have two 50-50 beam splitters and the second one is the inverse of the previous one. Then you get this identity evolution. If in one of the pathways I induce a pi phase shift for every photon, which is a parity operation, then I can swap the output. So that's a swap operation. So if in the pathway, it's a superposition of identity and the parity, which is the exponential parity as I showed here, then the output will be a superposition of identity and a swap, which is exactly the exponential swap that we need. So now the question is how do we do the uh, superposition of parity or exponential parity? It turns out there's a simple circuit to do it, assisted by a two level ancillary. 
So you prepare ancillary in a superposition of G and E, and do a control parity, then you rotate the ancillary and then control parity again. Your ancillary will be disentangled and restored to the initial state while you implement a, a exponential parity over this particular mode. So basically, as help with the help of a two-level ancillary, you can implement this exponential swap. And if you look at this circuit, actually we have all the ingredients available experimentally. The control parity is essentially the dispersive coupling with the evolution of time pi over chi, which is exactly how we extract the parity of a bosonic mode. So this operation has been demonstrated, uh, as mentioned earlier, within the parity measurement of quantum error correction. And the 50-50 beam splitter can be achieved, even though the two modes have different frequencies, you can use forward mixing helped with the Josephson nonlinearity to achieve with the two additional pumps, which will have a frequency difference matches with the frequency difference of these two modes. You can induce a 50 uh, with the correct evolution time, you can induce a 50-50 beam splitter as you want. So, and also the ancillary rotation should be easy. It's a, just a rotation of the qubit. So therefore you can implement this exponential swap operation. And here is just a particular, like a, uh, the process tomography on the left-hand side is theory, uh, on the left-hand side is experiment and the right-hand side is theory. And you see a good match, which indicating that we have a good fidelity of all the 85%, including um, the preparation and the measurement errors. So the gate fidelity, the true gate fidelity should be higher than this quantity. So just to, as a kind of like a point out that the snap gate, uh, this e-swap gate is actually like a, a very powerful, compatible with arbitrary bosonic code because the whole discussion I didn't talk about what code is. All you care is identity and swap, which holds universally for different codes. It's universal and it minimizes the transmount coupling time so that it will suffer less from the transmount decoherence. And you can also have some error detection capability because if your ancillary don't go back to this state, it's indicating something bad happened and you can probably eliminate that gate and uh, repeat it again. So in case people work on like a quantum dot, the snap gate is very similar to the exchange coupling because the swap operation, the swap Hamiltonian is essentially the spin exchange coupling Hamiltonian up to some additional constant addition. So therefore for two level system, each swap gate is equivalent to the exchange gate. However, here I'm talking about the e-swap gate can be more than two level. So I can consider e-swap over two bosonic modes. So it's actually a D larger than two, can be a D larger than two dimensional system. And in that case, then this analogy over spin systems, probably one need to further generalize that in order to understand. But when dimension is larger than two, or if it's a very high dimension, this act actually will give us some extra potential applications like a quantum principle component analysis and so on. So uh, maybe just as a, like a summary about like kind of what's the kind of quantum computing efforts with bosonic quantum error question is that basically uh, some of the major key challenges we talked is how to achieve control of a bosonic mode, how to implement the parity measurement fault tolerantly, and also perform like a, some like a coding dependent coupling gates. So here like a, we, one can achieve like a QND measurement and demonstrate like a break even of quantum error correction, do logical operations, at uh, uh, the logical level and even do for tolerant computing. And uh, here are some like related references as showing that one can uh, go from like a, starting from the parity measurement, go all the way up to towards some of the fault tolerant operations, including measurement and gates, robust against the dominant errors from the ancillary system. So um, basically like, a, uh, well, maybe uh, for the sake of time, I didn't go through more about the, this teleported gates, but in case you're interested, you can find it from this teleport gates, which we use a bell pair to implement a non-local C not gate. Yeah, I think I probably have like maybe one or two minutes, maybe just to uh, briefly like uh, just to mention that there is applications of bosonic codes besides computing. It can also be useful for communication. And uh, also, uh, also can maybe you can pitch and catch a quantum state from one superconducting cavity in another. And uh, moreover, this pitch and catch can be, can be achieved even though the waveguide between superconducting cavity is in a thermal state. The argument is pretty simple because essentially the entire operation is a bilinear Hamiltonian. So the mode actually, they do not mix. Uh, so suppose you have uh, some excitation in your cavity, you can 
basically like a pitch it into a particular mode in the waveguide. And the waveguide may have some background noise, but it's okay because it co-propagating together. And when you, you know that particular mode reaches the other cavity, you can catch it uh, perfectly without catching any of the noise in the background. So basically for the pitch and the catch experiment, all you need is really high quality thermal waveguide and allow you to do it. And recently there are multiple experiments, people demonstrate pitch and catch so that you can extend like a, your experiment to larger systems. And uh, so, um, but I think most of the experiments so far, the waveguide is still like a sufficiently low temperature so that the thermal noise still doesn't matter. But so the error correction could be useful if there is additional excitation loss or added thermal noise so that you can pitch and catch while doing error correction to like a connect different systems. So here's actually a picture by, uh, from Andrew Swarov's group, which recently posted on the archive that they did like a connect two dilution bridges separated by five meters and they pitch a microwave photon and attach from the other side and it verified there's entanglement being generated by such a pitch and catch. And uh, so uh, if you want to go to larger scale, you can consider you build like a, a repeater networks and here probably not uh, instead of uh, this uh, microwave like a, uh, like a low temperature waveguide, you can probably use optical fiber. But um, we know that optical fiber is good for communication, but information processing is maybe better to use microwave. So one possibility is to do the frequency conversion from optical to microwave and then do quantum error correction using our microwave device and then convert back to optical and then relay the information on to the next repeater station. And maybe cap code or other multi-mode code could be useful. And uh, there are also like advances that people look into the, uh, this uh, frequency conversion between optical and microwave. And uh, this error correction could also potentially be useful for communication over longer distances. And uh, so maybe like uh, just uh, one last slide in the technical part is basically like uh, we also like uh, so far like uh, there's no, even though uh, optical quantum computing or macro supernatural quantum computing has been like uh, um, being there for more than like two decades, but so far there's been no demonstration of a quantum entanglement between optical and the macro modes. Even though we use the microwave electronics to control optical modes, but that's not quantum, it's still classical. So it's desirable to have some first demonstration of the entanglement between these two very important uh, bosonic modes. And the one way to do it is probably we're thinking about using optical mechanical nonlinearity to like uh, pump the system at the blue detuned frequency so you can generate pairs of optical and microwave photons and potentially like do some bell measurements and see the violation of Bell's inequality that potentially can herald the existence of the entanglement between the optical modes and the microwave modes. So if that's possible, then that would open up a, a huge like a playground so that the people in optics can take advantage of a quantum control for microwave domain. And the people in the microwave domain could also take advantage of this uh, long distance like a communication achievable by optical domain uh, without suffer from this uh, 4K microwave background radiation. So we can really communicate longer distances. So just as a, like a here, like a summary that indeed we can use bosonic codes for various quantum information processing tasks. And if people are interested, I can discuss more like a, maybe in the discussion session about how to use it for quantum metrology or for quantum simulation and sampling. So finally, I would like to thank uh, uh, collaborators and, uh, and also the funding agencies. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much, Lang, for a very pedagogical and, and uh, informative talk. Um, still some time for people to enter some questions into the q and I'll just maybe uh, remind people that there will be a discussion section uh, to, to talk directly to Yang. And right now, appeared in the chat, is the, uh, the link. So uh, we will be going to that momentarily. Um, maybe uh, there have been a number of questions during the breaks, but maybe I'll just ask one myself, right, to conclude. So um, there are some new approaches that have just uh, been published about creating bo bosonic codes with optics at the optical frequencies based on squeeze states and linear optics and then measurement and post-selection as opposed to the kind of deterministic methods that you have with microwaves and transmons. So what, what, do you, what is your thought about that approach to creating codes or, or other approaches to do it in the optical domain? 
Yeah, well, I think that's uh, first very interesting that uh, um, actually um, you can use another nonlinearity instead of a kernel linearity here. You can use uh, this uh, like a measurement, uh, like detector nonlinearity to also achieve a quantum control. Yeah, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very exciting development. And uh, uh, I guess that probably the major challenge is that, okay, if you want to prepare like a, a larger size of CAT or like the GKP states and so on. So what would be the overhead? Uh, how many like uh, repetitions one need to try in order to prepare it. And I think another thing probably worth thinking about is that uh, so far that was the state preparation. And can we perform like a, a kind of active quantum error correction without destroying the state? And so that so we can actually store information longer. And I think that's something which will be uh, interesting to explore uh, in both optical and microwave domain. Okay, we have, I guess, one last question just appeared here in the Q&A. Uh, question is, is there a way to do the exponential swap operation fault tolerantly using the additional F state like there was in the snap gate? Yeah, um, uh, we're thinking about that. And uh, uh, so far, what I can say is that uh, uh, we think we can detect error but uh, we still don't know like how to correct those error. And especially, let me see if I can get that circuit, uh, is that there are two stages of a uh, 50-50 being split with uh, this uh, control parity. And uh, it's a bit tricky to distinguish whether where the error happened. Is it in the first control phase or it's the second control phase? And that could cause like different type of error. And this, but we can detect them, but we don't know like, okay, how to distinguish them if we could then we will be able to actually do it uh, fully for tolerance because so far it's only detection and it will be nice if you can do it correction. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. So I think we'll leave it there and, and thank you again, Liang, for a wonderful talk and um, uh, welcome everyone to uh, participate in the post seminar discussion. The link is there in the uh, Zoom uh, chat.